Hello everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening wherever you are in the world. I'm Zeb Bhatti and welcome to the Trust Era. Fundamentally, the whole point of blockchain is to redo societal design to create greater equality, to create trust through transparency and accountability, to redistribute wealth, be more compassionate and to value life. This whole blockchain revolution is about that. Our mission at the Trust Era is to guide organizations through this transition by promoting a comprehensive adoption of blockchain and associated technologies across all industries. This involves educating, consulting, designing token models and providing meaningful services that can enable organizations, individuals and the entire society to enjoy the benefits of a decentralized economy. This video is part two of blockchain security series. In the first part, we had vulnerabilities which arise from the blockchain structure. And in this part, uh, T302, we have attacks which are related to the consensus mechanism. And uh, the next uh, video will be on application-oriented attacks and then the last one would be on attacks on the peer-to-peer -peer system. So this video is on attacks which are related to the consensus mechanism. So let's get started with the first topic, uh, which is uh, what is a blockchain consensus mechanism? Uh, blockchain provides a secured paradigm to achieve consensus using a distributed and peer-to-peer -peer network in which no trusted central party is required. The topics in this video are going to be what is a blockchain consensus mechanism? What are the types of blockchain consensus mechanisms out there? What is a Sybil attack and the 51% attack? Next one is reward for uncle blocks. Then uh, we'll have vulnerabilities of consensus mechanisms. This includes the proof of work and proof of stake and finally the practical Byzantine fault tolerance or PBFT uh, mechanisms. Then uh, we'll talk about double spending, which has two uh, parts, uh, uh, the race attack and the Finney attack, and then uh, all uh, some other attacks uh, on the blockchain consensus mechanisms. So fundamentally, the whole point of blockchain technology is to redo societal design to create greater equality to enable more trust, to be more compassionate, to redistribute wealth and value, and to create transparency and all that stuff. So this whole blockchain revolution is about changing how the world operates. It's changing societies, it's changing how human beings interact with each other. It is the most disruptive technology uh, and it is the greatest wave of our lifetime. So you'll never see something like this again. A blockchain provides a secured paradigm to achieve consensus using distributed and peer-to-peer -peer network in which no trust or no trusted central party is required. Because of this feature, blockchain has the potential to resolve many challenges that are faced with current centralized controllers in the uh, our, uh, existing globally distributed uh, applications and uh, banking systems. To date, the blockchain technology has been used for recording transactions and tracking objects in which multiple participants reach a consensus on whether a transaction is valid or not. We are familiar with centralized consensus models. There are several massively collaborative applications where the participating entities do not necessarily trust each other and may be competitive. Uh, these are called multi-trust domain applications. An example of uh, a multi-trust domain is the current banking system. The banks do not necessarily trust each other and therefore need the services of a centralized trustworthy organization. Uh, we have uh, something called SWIFT, which is a Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication uh, to, tran uh, to transact. This uh, centralized solution not only introduces delays and substantial costs, but is also used selectively to block individuals, organizations, and even nations 
from fair access to the uh, network. Uh, one, this is one of the major problems for a, of a centralized authority. It all started with Bitcoin. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto did the right things at the right time. When Bitcoin came out in 2009, the world was falling apart after the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Lehman Brothers collapsed, real estate markets had collapsed, the stock exchange collapsed, and we also had the Greek uh, financial crisis. So it was in 2009, uh, and Satoshi Nakamoto introduced Bitcoin. He did not know that he was laying down the foundations of a whole new trust model based on computer alg algorithmic consensus that would become the heart of a decentralized crypto economy one day. Bitcoin became the first digital payment system for P2P exchange of money. Now the technology behind Bitcoin, uh, which is blockchain, is used in many other applications, including voting, online gaming, logistics, uh, supply chains, ownership rights, asset tracking and management, and so much more. As mentioned earlier, the heart of a blockchain is a consensus algorithm and protocol. The consensus decision-making in a blockchain has to be absolutely bulletproof for blockchain mass adoption to happen. Specifically, both the consensus methods, which is how miners, validators, or nodes actually agree on the accuracy of transactions, and the consensus mechanism, uh, which is all the ways to prevent attacks on transactions, uh, both the consensus methods and consensus mechanism have to be 100% sound. And this is for uh, ensuring there's re resiliency to malicious or bad agents, there's a resilience to malicious miners, uh, there, there can't be any distributed denial of service attacks, and uh, there is no fraud uh, it, that's happening, uh, and we have fraud mitigation. Uh, by the way, Wikipedia defines uh, consensus uh, decision-making as a group decision-making process in which group members develop and agree to support a decision in the best interest of the whole. Another definition of consensus is that at the heart of every blockchain lies a protocol that defines how pseudonymous individuals reach consensus in a globally distributed network. So consensus in crypto is no different from, uh, for example, consensus between a group of friends deciding where to go for dinner. All the friends decide mutually and agree and develop the consensus uh, to go out and have dinner somewhere. If somebody doesn't agree, then you know there's a new uh, consensus. The only difference is that consensus uh, in the crypto uh, world or crypto consensus is digital and the blockchain protocol is deciding on which transactions are valid. Uh, humans don't decide it. Uh, now let's look at the components of a blockchain. That is uh, what makes up the core of the blockchain system. A blockchain consists of two main components, a database and a network of nodes. A blockchain's database is a centralized, distributed, shared, temper-aware, and fault-tolerant data store. Uh, and that data store keeps track of transactions uh, in a ledger, which is called the uh, decentralized ledger. Blocks are formed by bundling together a number of transactions, and each block is linked to its predecessor block by a hash. The blockchain's network consists of many distributed nodes that maintain the database in a peer-to-peer -peer network. Nodes have access to the blocks, but nodes cannot change blocks or any contents in the block. A hash is a fixed length numeric value that relates to the previous block data in the blockchain. In addition to the hash, each block has a timestamp indicating when it was created a signature proving its correctness and integrity, and a random number, which is called a nonce, for cryptographic operations. Some blockchains may have different types of puzzles to solve uh, in lieu of a nonce. 
The use of sophisticated cryptographic techniques, that is the signature and encryption schemes, guarantee security in a blockchain. This novel architecture of this technology yields many appealing characteristics, such as a decentralized consensus, trustless partners, provable security, immutability, which means no one can change, delete, or tamper transactions, non-repudiation guarantees, and this transactions and blocks that are once signed by these elegant uh, signature schemes pretty much guarantee uh, that uh, the transaction cannot be repudiated. And finally, overall distributed and decentralized management capabilities. One of the most powerful features of the, of the technology is that it allows nodes to communicate without a trusted broker or a trusted third party. The consensus is decentralized as there is no central authority and decisions can only be made by majority agreement. A trustless partner's feature is that it as a trust is imposed by a majority rather than by a single controller. As the example I mentioned earlier in the case of SWIFT, uh, where you know the SWIFT uh, software uh, can be uh, used to control flow of funds between people and between uh, organizations and countries and thereby uh, imposing sanctions on individuals and organizations and nations, uh, which is uh, not fair uh, because uh, uh, it is uh, biased on whoever controls the SWIFT system. When a node wants to interact with another, it sends its uh, interaction in the form of a transaction. Many transactions are then collected and bundled to form a block. A block is verified by everyone uh, and, and is added to the chain if it's valid. Otherwise, it's dropped and the transactions will be recorded in another block. Both transactions and blocks are digitally signed, hence they cannot be changed or denied in the future. The management of the blockchain is distributed as the blockchain database is maintained by many blockchain nodes and no party has full control over the system. Blockchain nodes store the chain of blocks, validate new blocks, and add these new blocks to the chain. There are three main types of nodes in a typical blockchain. The first type is the block producers. Block producer nodes uh, are the ones that construct blocks and who, com who compete to be the first to form a new block. Block validator nodes validate the block and only then it's appended to the chain. And of course there's the blockchain users which are nodes that use the blockchain. With the maturity of the blockchain now there are other types of nodes uh, such as archival nodes and, uh, uh, and uh, also uh, discovery and search nodes. Uh, but that's uh, a different discussion. The basic framework for approaching blockchain technologies just in general can be summarized uh, in these uh, three main tasks of, that the blockchains perform. The first task is to decide who is in charge of making the block. Uh, that's your miner or validator. The second is that you have to make the block and then the network has to accept the block. To, and that forms the version of truth. Those are really the only three things that are going on in a blockchain. You have to figure out who's going to make the block, then you're going to make the block, and the network accepts the block, and that's it. The block is only accepted if the majority agree, or the majority of participants agree, and arrive at a consensus. Now, let's take a look at the types of blockchain consensus mechanisms that are out there. There are several different protocols and algorithms for achieving consensus. As the decentralized economy vision is gradually becoming real, many more and unique new protocols and algorithms are emerging. Now, some of these are very unique to specific domains. So there's a uh, list of these pro uh, consensus protocols. We won't discuss all of them. Uh, in this session, we'll just work on proof of work and proof of stake, but the general concept uh, followed uh, by all is the same. So we have proof of work, proof of stake, proof of activity, proof of authority, proof of history, proof of useful work, least proof of stake, uh, proof of weight, 
Delegated Byzantine Fault Tolerance, DBFT. Simplified Byzantine Fault Tolerance, SBFT. Delegated Proof of Stake Consensus, Practical Byzantine, Byzantine Fault Tolerance, PBFT. Proof of Elapsed Time, Proof of Burn, Proof of Capacity, and Proof of Importance. So you can see that as uh, uh, the industry is maturing, uh, more unique uh, domain-specific algorithms uh, will be coming out. As mentioned earlier, the most dominant consensus protocols in the industry are proof of work and proof of stake with their different flavors. All consensus protocols pretty much do the same thing. They make the block and apply the network to accept the block. So consensus protocols are at the heart of the blockchain. The entire blockchain ecosystem relies on this one component. Thus, the reliance and security of this component is most important and of top priority. Now let's get into the vulnerability uh, of uh, consensus mechanisms. The um, first is Sybil attack. The Sybil attack is a type of uh, malicious assault that targets peer-to-peer -peer networks. It involves a single entity faking and operating multiple identities at the same time in order to gain majority control. Basically, one node pretends to be uh, many different nodes uh, and uh, they then uh, gain majority control. And once you have majority votes, you can single-handedly decide which chain counts as the version of truth uh, among the possible valid chains. With the majority 51% votes, that node has the power to censor transactions or perform a double spend attack. I'll cover the double spend attack a little later. The civil attack can be used to stop transactions from being performed. Uh, they can reorder transactions or even reverse transactions to cause, cause double spending. For example, in August 2021, Bitcoin SV version uh, with this uh, symbol of BSV, underwent a 51% attack that let uh, malicious miners double spend coins. This caused a severe plunge in BSV price. Ultimately, a Sybil attack is one of the leading threats for blockchains. These assaults can damage crypto values, steal funds, and affect user privacy and eventually confidence, among other things. Most prevention strategies simply rely on making the cost of an attack too pricey, but these methods do not guarantee security. To avoid civil attacks, blockchain networks need to design their systems from ground up very, very thoughtfully. This includes uh, things like how blockchain producers and block validators are selected, how frequently blocks are produced, when is transaction finality achieved, what forms of user verification security exists, and there are others as well. The main purpose of a consensus mechanism is to deter civil attacks. Civil resistance is why proof of work and proof of stake consensus protocols exist at all in the first place. They are fundamentally a means of making it very difficult to corrupt a blockchain by incentivizing miners uh, in the case of proof of work and validators uh, in the case of proof of stake to process transactions correctly and in some cases punishing them for not doing so. Neither of these two consensus mechanisms is perfect, however. Each one comes with its own trade-offs regarding decentralization, scalability, security, and of course sustainability, which has been an especially hot topic among proof-of-work critics due to the energy usage and uh, global warming and climate change. The correct consensus mechanism ultimately depends on what the blockchain is quest in question is trying to do, is trying to achieve, as this will determine which trade-offs need to be made. Naturally, these trade-offs must be examined in detail when deciding. Earlier, I had mentioned the uh, problem of decentralization, security, and scalability. Uh, this is now called a blockchain trilemma. Uh, there are, these are the three different elements that are desirable in a blockchain. De decentralization, security, and scalability. The blockchain trilemma 
refers to the idea that is that it is hard for blockchains to achieve optimal levels of all three properties simultaneously. Either you can have scalability at the cost of security and decentralization, or you can have more security and decentralization, but you won't have uh, scalability. So uh, all three are very difficult to achieve, and no blockchain that we know of has achieved them so far. So the blockchain uh, uh, trilemma is something that is a challenge, and uh, I'll go over each one. Uh, let's talk about scal uh, scalability first. Uh, scalability means achieving higher number of transactions at a faster rate and with lower transaction fees, uh, despite the growth of the network. So as the user base grows and the network grows and adoption grows, the blockchain transaction rate must not slow down. So far, Bitcoin has five transactions per second and Ethereum has seven transactions per second. And they have not attained any more, any higher uh, speeds. Scalability is an indispensable component of blockchain to meet the growing number of users. In both Bitcoin and Ethereum, the numbers have grown and the network has expanded globally, but they have not been able to uh, solve the speed problem. To ensure both security and scalability, companies have to shift from the proof of work to proof of stake consensus model. And uh, this compromises the decentralization uh, because it's easier to have proof of stake validators as the investment is much lower. Decentralization. This is the feature that has revolutionized the digital financial era. In fact, the blockchain has become popular because of its decentralization features. In a decentralized network, power is distributed equally among all entities. Each miner and validator in a blockchain enjoys the same privileges. No one participant can make the network behave in a certain manner without approval from the rest. But achieving scalability along with decentralization is extremely difficult. Scalability moves blockchains towards becoming more centralized and more permissioned networks, allowing only select users to access the blockchain and the blockchain ledger. The proof of work mechanism, which is mostly used by decentralized platform, uh, is preferred for decentralization, but that leads to tremendous power consumption during mining while lowering the scalability. On the other hand, proof of stake uh, allows more scalability and speed, but compromises on decentralization. Finally, the security feature of the blockchain trilemma. This is the most vital component which prevents the blockchain network from being disrupted by malicious attacks. Without security, blockchains would become untrustworthy and malware infested. Although the majority of the decentralized blockchains have robust security, their open source features make it vulnerable to hackers. For example, currently flash loans and collateral-less loans are the easiest way to dupe users and hack into a network. Achieving security with scalability is the most challenging task as both oppose each other's functionality. Security works well with proof-of-work blockchain model, which needs lots of miners, but it consumes a lot of power. However, uh, scalability gets adversely affected with the increase of miners mostly due to the cost of P the POW model and the limitations of power availability. And this results in lower transaction speed. On the other hand, proof of stake offers more scalability and it's, it's easier to set up uh, more miners, but the compromise uh, of security uh, comes and also decentralization. So now let me illustrate how a 51% attack works. Uh, we'll use a proof of work uh, algorithm. In proof of work networks, a group of miners conspire to control more than 50% of the network's mining hash rate. Once the attackers have majority network control, 
They can interrupt the recording of new blocks by preventing other miners from completing blocks and stopping other miners from generating new blocks. Uh, this unlocks the ability to overthrow the consensus algorithm and uh, reject otherwise valid blocks from being added to the chain or add malicious content in the blocks. The 51 percent attack constitutes an attack on the consensus algorithm and it, thus it's also known as the consensus hijacking. A stealthier 51 percent attack might be possible with less than the amount of computation power. It is possible to take other nodes out of action by disturbing the transmission of the current state of the blockchain. Therefore, the power of these uninformed nodes would be lost and the overall cost of, for the attack decreases by partitioning the network this way. So the 51 percent attack is a critical threat to the integrity and availability of the network, as you can see. In permission blockchains, the threat situation with regards to the 51 percent attacks is different, as uh, there consists an increased level of trust between the members uh, in that blockchain based on the authentication hurdle. With the central authority granting permissions, uh, this type of attack is more from an insider, where an administrative entity inside uh, that organization could take control over the net blockchain. As you can see, this is a prime example of the vulnerability in a permissioned blockchain. In public permissionless blockchains, uh, since there is no regulating or controlling authority in each adversary is unknown to each other, uh, the main threat of the 51% attack stems from unknown hackers mostly. So let's talk about uh, what measures we can take to mitigate 51% majority attacks in uh, proof of work and uh, proof of stake uh, blockchains. Uh, if the blockchain network is based on a proof of work algorithm, it is possible to arbitrarily make the computation step harder. So an attacker would need exorbitant amounts of computation power to be successful. However, this results in increased power consumption for the blockchain, or the entire blockchain, and that's the downside. Another way to further mitigate uh, such an attack is by spreading the adoption of blockchain technology. And uh, this applies to both uh, proof of work and proof of stake. Uh, by having a large number of nodes and miners, it increases the threshold of computing power and validation nodes required to possess more than 50 percent. Uh, this works, as I said, for both uh, and many other types of blockchains. And the third way of uh, mitigating uh, 51 percent attacks also is uh, more directed towards proof of work. Uh, that is uh, to have the uh, consensus run in two phases. There is a proposal for two-phase proof-of-work mechanism to solve the problem of cooperative mining. In such network, the systematic risk of, network, of the network is no longer a 51% computing power attack, but a 51% node attack. That is, a mine owner has mastered more than 51% of the independent nodes in the entire network. So, and that's quite difficult. Attacks are destructive to the system, but obviously it is much easier to master 51% of computing power than to master 51% of the nodes of the network. There are some prerequisites of uh, carrying out the 51% attack, uh, and uh, they vary based on the affected blockchain structure and the used consensus algorithms and protocols. So for proof of work, more than 51% of the raw computational power of the network is required. For proof of stake, more than 51% of the committed stake is required. And for practical uh, Byzantine fault tolerance, uh, more than 33% of all replicas in theory are required to influence the network. In practice, it is sufficient to take over the single primary node or leader node in the PBFT protocol. Let's uh, take a look at the trade-offs between proof-of-work and proof-of-stake. In proof-of-work consensus, the major benefit is that it's been battle-tested at scale, even though there, has been, uh, there have been a few 51% attacks on smaller proof-of-work uh, networks, uh, such as uh, notably the Ethereum Classic way back, 
uh, but overall uh, they are battle tested and hardened networks. Purchasing the computing power required to conduct a 51% attack against a uh, blockchain uh, POW uh, uh, proof of work uh, blockchain uh, such as Bitcoin would be so expensive that it would make no sense to do uh, it unless you are, you know, like a government agency or a very high-powered uh, organization trying to protect your national uh, currency or national interest against uh, BTC, of course. Uh, well, how much uh, would you, how much would it cost to corrupt Bitcoin, for example, uh, and other major uh, proof-of-work networks? For Bitcoin, uh, at present, uh, which is 2022, it would cost over $8.6 billion in hardware costs, plus uh, $20 million in energy costs per day uh, to carry out a 51% uh, attack. Here's another example. Uh, there was a famous New York agreement in, of 2017, as it's called, uh, when uh, they were trying to uh, increase the Bitcoin's block size. 50 institutions, uh, including many exchanges, uh, and uh, organizations uh, tried to convince the uh, crypto community behind Bitcoin to double the Bitcoin's block size. Their initiative failed because Bitcoin's nodes refused to implement the change uh, the institutions wanted to see. Uh, but the interesting thing is that had the uh, Bitcoin uh, consensus model been proof of stake, uh, they would have gotten away with it. Uh, this resistance to in institutional influence would have been difficult, if not impossible, uh, if Bitcoin was a proof of stake, because the institutions would have been able to simply buy up the stake they needed to implement changes uh, they wanted in the blockchain level. So this is one of the risks of uh, a proof of uh, stake consensus models, that uh, people with money can buy large enough stakes to influence the network. The next topic is uh, reward for uncle blocks. Rewards for uh, uncle blocks refers to a vulnerability of the reward mechanism of Ethereum uh, that incited to selfish mining. Ethereum has an additional reward feature on top of regular block rewards called uncle and nephew rewards. An uncle block is a stale block outside of the main chain which directly refers to a regular block in the chain. In other words, stale blocks of the first order closest to the main chain can become uncle blocks. If a future regular block down the line starts referencing this stale uncle block, the new block is then called the nephew block and the creator of the uncle block gets the uncle reward. The rewarded amount is set by the distance between the uncle and the nephew. An uncle can gain up to seven-eighths of the amount of a regular block reward. Uh, nephews will always get uh, one-thirty-second uh, of that. As uncle blocks are unique to Ethereum networks only, there is no threat to other blockchains, uh, especially those that, that are not using uh, this reward system. On Bitcoin, there is no reward mechanism for stale blocks, and the stale block rate is just 0.41%. Ethereum, on the other hand, with the uncle mechanism, has a stale block rate of approximately 6.8%. This mechanism reduces the overall security of the blockchain as it loses stability because of the amount of stale blocks it has to handle. Uh, the prerequisites of uncle blocks and the reward me mechanisms appear to be an exclusive problem uh, for on Ethereum. And uh, any selfish miner can produce an abundance of blocks in the hope for profit on Ethereum. So uh, this section is on uh, vulnerabilities of consensus mechanism. Previously, we looked at the consensus from the 51% uh, Sybil attack perspective. So let's look at the vulnerabilities of uh, proof-of-work uh, protocols. In proof-of-work consensus mechanisms, miners have to put effort, uh, which is work, into providing mathematical proof during the creation of a new valid block. Blockchains uh, that have existed for a considerable amount of time, uh, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, experience an increase of uh, cumulative hash power in the network. 
This means that uh, computing hashes get increasingly more expensive to the individual miner as the level of difficulty increases. Furthermore, hash computation usually has a narrow time window until it has to be completed, which could be hard to get into. Uh, since reward for these efforts are usually just granted to those who are actually creating the new valid block, new validated block, it means that all other miners will not be rewarded for their spent efforts. To counter this problem, miners started to increase their hash rates by using specialized hardware. All this leads to large amounts of energy being wasted uh, with no results. Bitcoin alone wastes more than 71 terawatt hours yearly just for the proof of work mechanism, according to estimates. Another measure to counter the expensive hashing process are uh, mining pools. Miners put together their power, which leads uh, to them owning cert uh, certain parts of the network. If these pools are getting too large, attacks such as double spending or majority tax uh, could, get, uh, could become very possible. Additionally, control over the entire blockchain uh, could be compromised. Now let's look at the vulnerabilities of proof of stake. Uh, POS was introduced to overcome obvious problems of uh, proof of work. Energy consumption is reduced, which makes it more sustainable, uh, like a green solution. Additionally, thresholds for majority attacks get increased. While proof of work uses probabilistic approaches, where miners get approved randomly, proof of stake uses deterministic approach. Validators are selected using a process called bidding. There, they have to bid their stake which is their balance, and the candidate with the highest stake are selected to be the next validator. Malicious behavior will lead to the loss of the stake. POS is more resistant to majority attacks than POW. It is uh, no longer the computational power of the network, but rather the attackers need to own half the entire balance of crypto beforehand. On the other hand, the downside of proof of stake is that wealthy validators keep on winning the bid, which in turn grants them the block reward, leading to a few validators becoming rich each time, while new candidates, uh, validation candidates, have barely any chance of winning a bid. In turn, this leads to a pseudo-centralized system and defeats the purpose of a decentralized public blockchain. Uh, now, the vulnerabilities of the Byzantine fault, fault tolerance practical Byzantine fall tolerance. Uh, this protocol is used in private permission blockchains the most. In uh, this trusted environment, the network is grouped into active and passive replicas. For all replicas, one, one is selected to be the primary node. This node is the one who receives all transactions and pushes them out to the active replica so they can sign the transaction and share it with other replicas. The results that get trans transmitted back to the primary node who collects them and forges a new block with the signed transactions. This new block is then broadcasted over the network. The whole process, the whole protocol relies on the fact that the primary node is trustworthy and not compromised. There is a number of actions a, comp a compromised primary replica could take, such as discard correct approvals and stop transaction execution meddling with transaction order to actively create delay in the entire block generation process and will holding blocks and transactions and falsifying transaction approvals. Actors in a private blockchain network are usually known and therefore it is relatively easy to pinpoint malicious activity to certain members. However, if damage is caused, locating the malicious member is just a reactive or corrective measure and not a proactive one. Another weakness of P BFT is scalability. Larger networks would suffer from the communication overhead between the replicas and performance uh, decreases. One of the key weaknesses of PBFT is that it has a comparatively small tolerance to malicious nodes in the network, with just 33% compared to the 50% uh, in uh, proof of work and proof of stake. This low fault tolerance is a major problem, especially since private networks usually are tremendously smaller in size than public networks, which additionally reduces the number of nodes needed. 
what are the prerequisites? An attacker has to know the system and the implemented consensus mechanism and protocols to choose the right attack and attack vectors. For each, there are slight deviations. For proof of work, hash computation usually has a narrow time window until it has to be completed, which could be hard to get into. Since rewards for these efforts are usually just granted to those who are creating the new validated block, all other miners will not be rewarded for their spent efforts. For proof of stake, the downside of proof of stake is that wealthy validators keep on winning the bid, which in turn grants them the block reward, leading to a few validators becoming rich each time while the new candidates have barely any chance of winning the bid. This leads to a pseudo-centralized system that defeats the purpose of the decentralized public blockchain. And for practical Byzantine fault tolerance, the protocol relies on the fact that primary node is trustworthy and not compromised. There are a number of actions compromised a primary replica could take, namely discard correct approvals and stop transaction execution. Meddling with transaction order actively create delay in the entire blockchain uh, block generation process, withholding blocks and transactions and falsifying uh, transaction records. The last and final topic is uh, double spending. Double spending is a means that an already spent cryptocurrency can be used twice or more. The transaction information within a blockchain can be altered. This allows altered and modified blocks to enter the blockchain. And if this happens, the hackers who altered the blocks in a chain can reclaim already spent cryptocurrency. A general problem of digital data, which includes digital currencies, is that data can be easily copied because it's just bits stored on a computer. A Bitcoin is basically nothing but just scrambled data set, which can be copy, copied infinitely. This is the digital equivalent of counterfeit money. As with physical currency, such copies will increase the pool of available coins massively and in turn decrease their value. So what is double spending and why is it such a problem? Uh, it's a major computing problem that has to be solved uh, by every blockchain. If not, the blockchain in question is essentially worthless because anyone can duplicate a transaction with a chain at any time. Double spending means that the same units of currency could potentially be spent twice by circumventing the verified mechanism. There are different techniques that are used, which can be used uh, by the adversaries and hackers. So it's crucial to technologically eliminate all possibilities of double spending. Double spending would basically destroy the technological ground on which a blockchain is founded, a database that is not only tamper-proof, but also records every transaction that has ever taken place within the network. Thus, the potential to execute double spending would fundamentally undermine the trust in a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, for example, or any other blockchain database like Ethereum or so forth. The main issue of double spending arises from the fact that confirmations of transactions on a blockchain take time. This situation is not ideal for payments, uh, which have to be processed fast, instantly in order to immediately sell goods. Uh, for example, digital products sold uh, online uh, and downloads, uh, the payments have to be make, made instantly. If another transaction invalidates the payment, the already released goods are lost to the attacker. There are two prominent variants of double spending. One is called race attack. In this attack, the malicious actor starts two different transactions at the same time, referring to the same funds that are only sufficient for just one transaction. Only one of these transactions can be validated. This enables the, attack, uh, the attacker to retrieve double the amount of goods for the same amount of money if both receivers don't validate first. The second one is the Finney attack. During a Finney attack, funds are used in a transaction, but the attacker is withholding a pre-prepared block with the same transaction to one of his own accounts. When the shop releases the goods, the attacker broadcasts his block, which then invalidates the initial transaction by making the network believe that the actual transaction is the one that has been the pre-prepared block. So there are some prerequisites for these uh, the double spend tax. 
For a successful double spending attack under normal circumstances, it's required to complete two successful separate transactions fast, uh, faster than it takes to verify one of them and realize it and uh, before any problems are realized. However, there is also a possibility of double spending attacks exploiting the fork of a blockchain.